close to you Never let me go I lay it all down again To hear you say that I'm your friend You are my desire No one else will do Nothing else can take your place To feel the warmth of your embrace Help me find the way Bring me back to you that your heart beat today as we join together and get together. It's a little washed out right now because of the lighting and everything else. It's not the kind of lighting I have at home and I had to move from where I was because the light was so bright coming in the window that uh, uh, you wouldn't have been able to see anything but the sun and the brightness and all of that. We are up in Spokane visiting with Laura and uh, and Chris this uh, for the next couple of days. I'm sitting in their office looking out the window here and looking at pine trees and mountains and hills and bright sky and it is beautiful. We kind of walked around downtown Spokane and around the park area down there this afternoon uh, but came back got some work done and Got ready for tonight, last night. So we're here together. May God bless you. You know, there's a lot of things going on. <clears throat> a lot of things happening in a lot of people's worlds. And uh, I think it's uh, time to drag out that verse that has been so special to me the last couple of years and throw it out there for you. Just to put in your memory. In Isaiah 42 and verse 16, write it down if you haven't remembered it. 
But I will take the hand of those who don't know the way, who can't see where they're going, and I'll be a personal guide to them, directing them through unknown country. I'll be right there to show them what roads to take. Make sure they don't fall into a ditch. These are the things that I'm going to do for them, sticking with them and not leaving them for one moment. Isn't that a blessed promise? Do you know what uh, tomorrow holds? Do you know what today holds? Do you know what's right around the corner? I certainly don't. I don't know any of those things, but God does. In fact, God's there before we ever turn the corner and we're going to meet him face to face. He's preparing our tomorrow today so that when we get there, it's all ready for us. And I pray that's a word of encouragement for you tonight as we gather together. Cassiana, it is so good to see you this evening. God bless you. It's good to have you on board with us. There's my dear Sherry. She is downstairs with Laura and the puppies and uh, Chris. And there's Miss Terry. Faithful as ever, Miss Terry, we love you too, if I can get the right directions. Looking at the camera is different because when you're looking at the camera, right's left, left's right, your brain doesn't work that way. There's my sweet Miss Sue also on this evening. It is so good to be here with all of you. That's the one I wanted, all right. That is the one I wanted. All right. In fact, I don't know why I'm going to leave it there, but I will. I'll leave it there for a bit. I know there's probably some things we want to take a look at. You know, uh, the Lord is pursuing the first premise of experiencing God. You know, God is pursuing an intimate love relationship with you. And we can see it most plainly when we come to that tabernacle in the wilderness. Well, last week and the week before in our search for Christ in the Old Testament, that's where we are. We came to the tabernacle in the wilderness. I've taught on it several times, love it. It's one of my favorite parts of, I don't know but what I'm going to have to maybe move this over on this side and move me somewhere. Nothing seems to want to work. All right, well, it works. It's just that... Uh, uh, I'm dealing with one camera in place and only one camera, and it happens to go wherever the computer goes. I can't make it go anyplace else or different. So bear with me just a moment while I try to do a little bit of technical stuff and get stuff up there for you. And, uh, you know, there we go. At any rate, uh, it became, you know, God's dwelling place among uh, among his people. I think I shared with you last week that one very interesting fact about the tabernacle is that there's more, more space devoted to the account of the tabernacle in Scripture than any other single object. Not the cross, you know, uh, not, uh, you know, not, not, even, uh, not even Jerusalem or, or the temple carries as much weight or as much space for us as we have there in a study of the tabernacle. Well, Exodus chapters uh, 25, good morning or good evening. I got my days and nights mixed up again. I'm just like a kid that don't know what time of day it is. Uh, Exodus chapters 25 through 40, give us the detail of the plans and the construction of the tabernacle or the ten of meetings. You also have much of the book of Exodus and you got Leviticus and uh, Deuteronomy and parts of Numbers that you get these are taken up with activities in and around the tabernacle. In fact, you can't understand uh, the tabernacle without going to Leviticus. It gives us the great story of it. And truthfully, the greatest commentary on the tabernacle is to be found in the New Testament in that book of Hebrews where it is prominent. All right. Now, in Exodus 25 and verses 8 through 9, it says, let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them according to all that I'm going to show you as a pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the furniture, just so you shall construct it. Now, the tabernacle was evidence that God had graciously brought a redeemed people out from slavery into a place of nearness to him. In order to do that, God had them make the tabernacle. 
And it was there that he dwelled. The, the, the fire would fill the temple and come out of there and cover the camp at night and the, and the cloud during the day. And it became the place of sacrifice. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin and there can be no nearness to God. So the tabernacle was a place where sacrifice was made. Outside the court stood the brazen altar where the animals were brought and on which they were slain and the blood poured out. And there the blood was shed, the atonement was made for sin. Moreover, Jesus Christ fulfilled in his very person the typical significance of the brazen altar. The body in which he tabernacled on earth was nailed to a cross outside the city. The cross was the altar on which God's perfect spotless lamb was slain and where his precious blood was shed and where complete atonement was made for our sin. Furthermore, Jesus rose from the dead. I mean, he was buried like that scapegoat carried out into the wilderness. He was buried, shut off from men and from the land of the living. But on the third day, he rose. He rose uh, to give life, went off all those who would believe. Probably the greatest and most thrilling mystery revealed to Paul was this mystery, this truth that had been hidden through all the ages. He writes it to the church in Colossae in chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. This mystery which has been hidden from the ages and generations, but has now been manifest to the saints, to whom God willed it to be made known. What the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, I don't know if you have prayer requests out there. I, I, I pray you do. Uh, if you do, get them you know, written up, get them typed in there, and we'll pass them on to everybody in just a moment after our mission video, which we will look at Bulgaria tonight and the mission work that began there. Then we were kicked out, and we're going to listen to the story uh, that came out here a few years ago about going back in and seeing what God had done through the seeds that had been planted years ago after the fall of the Berlin Wall. All right, so we're going to look at that. But let me give you a couple of those prayer requests this evening. Uh, we have Buck and Janice. They're traveling on the road. They went to a family funeral. And they'll, they're, they'll be on their way home, be home by the end of the week. Uh, there's also uh, Betty, who is settling into her new digs out there where Cindy lives. Uh, and uh, uh, there's also Dale, who is rapidly uh, uh, going downhill fast. He's on hospice. We went out and visited the other day. And uh, and though he was alert and, and coherent and, and all of this, you can tell the signs of, uh, of things slowing down within his body. So be in prayer for him as well. Be in prayer for a young man named Cameron. He is uh, uh, the stepson, uh, if you will, of uh, 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 Heather Gibbs. So be in prayer for him. He attempted suicide. Uh, I think they've released him from the hospital, but I haven't heard about his condition. And then... Uh, Yesterday, uh, Carolyn got a hold of me and her friend Mary, uh, they're so close, her granddaughter and their, her little baby were sleeping in the apartment the other night and she woke up to the smell of smoke, grabbed the baby, ran out of the apartment with just what they had on and uh, the apartment complex was on fire and her apartment was consumed and they lost everything. They're staying with Mary right now. And uh, so we need to remember them, lift them up in prayer. And there may come a time that we have further involvement by being able to help in some way to get her reestablished. Now, many of you met a friend that Sherry and I made this friendship on our trip last year. Linda was in service, Linda Sims, on Sunday. And uh, she left to head back and she picked her friend up and they went up over Lolo Pass and into... Uh, uh, Idaho, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the city. But at any rate, uh, today they had to take a little detour there in, uh, almost had it there. Uh, at any rate, uh, because they had a thump thump in their tire, they got into Les Schwab and there they found out they had a big bubble in their tire 
and the tire was about ready to blow. So they had to get a new tire. But God was so gracious in protecting them. They could have had a blowout on the top or going up Lolo Pass, and that would have been a whole not a whole whole nother uh, uh, Boise, Idaho. <laughs> See, you get to stumbling trying to come up with that name. And uh, but they could have had a, a very dangerous, dangerous uh, situation going for them on the pass. But God held that tire together, got them down to uh, uh, to his already go going out the door. But at any rate, they uh, are safe and sound. Keep praying for their trip as the next stop is down to Colorado Springs, and then they'll meander the way eastward again to where Linda lives in Florida, in Kissimmee, Florida. All right? Well, let's take a moment and let's go over our mission video. We went to Bulgaria in early 91. It's right after the fall of the Soviet Union. The churches, those that had buildings, even meeting in apartments, they were packed wall to wall. A lot of people were coming out of curiosity, a lot of people thinking they might get a handout, but the large majority of the people were coming because there was a spiritual hunger. When Bill was preaching, I was starting to be more and more um, enthusiastic about this God because before I, th before I thought it was just the right thing to do and now it seems like it's a more personal thing to do. Slowly but surely I got convinced that it's not just the cause, it's Him and He wants to have personal relationship and the right thing to do is to be baptized, to, to acknowledge in front of everybody that yes, He loves you, you love Him, He's called you, you accepted the call and um, you want to enter into fellowship with Him. In 28 years on the field, June and I lived in 10 different countries. Most of the times it was because uh, we really didn't have any other choice. <laughs> when we left Bulgaria, it was because uh, three or four years after entering, the government had kind of changed their mind. So they basically kicked us out because they really did not want evangelical presence in the country at that time. But you're left with sort of an empty feeling, not being able to maintain the contact. This was pre-internet, uh, pre-email days, but communication was very, very difficult. It was kind of painful to the heart uh, for June and me both. And you think back and wonder, <laughs> what was our time like there? You, you know, did we accomplish anything? Was there any fruit at all? Hello. Hey. Hey, guys. It is so good to see you. I I'm George, by the way. <laughs> we can't believe this is actually happening right now. It's so good to see you guys. And this is my wife, Laura. Having heard that uh, Joro has planted several churches, he's led uh, 70 or more people to the Lord, is really being used as, as, an, as God's instrument there in Bulgaria. It brings an indescribable joy to my heart. At the moment, it's an exciting time uh, in Bulgaria on through the, the, the social work we do with the community. A lot of people are coming to church and are willing to to have interaction with us, asking questions, and um, it's, it's a good time. The gospel is expanding and growing, and this is the way it grows, through multiplication. Uh, from one missionary, then out to locals, and then more locals, and raising up of national leaders all over the world. It was like a machine for God, in, in, in my mind. Back then I knew what He was doing, but now as I'm grown up and I'm in the ministry, knowing what He's been doing, it's amazing uh, how God used them. I just hope that one day, I, when I go in retrospect or have people talk about it, that God uses my life in such a way to, to impact others. Yeah, your generosity transforms lives. I like that uh, because that's what we've been trying to impress upon folks is exactly that truth. When we are generous, God can use that generosity. He can use it in the lives of others. As we partner together in mission work, both here and overseas, that's what we are about. Part of That's part of the passion. That's part of the DNA of our church. And for those of you that listen and you're, you're not a part or you, you don't know us that well, that's exactly what, what we'd like people to understand is uh, when you give, you give to something significant. You give to something far beyond what you or I 
can do. We give to something that is much, much greater than we are. Uh, we are partnering in an international relationship that is reaching people from all ethnic groups, all people groups across the spectrum, without any reservation. We have missionaries on the field in very dangerous places where their life could be taken at any moment, but yet they are there. They are there under the call of God, and we need to support them. So we support that. We support uh, the kind of uh, social work that gets done in those places and here at home. Uh, we have networks of churches and people that are uh, busy working in their community, helping to meet the needs of those communities. We are all a part of that. So uh, you want to get connected to something far greater than yourself. Get connected with a church, and you will see something wonderful that God does. Let's uh, take a moment and let's go to prayer, all right? Remembering those prayer requests. Father, I come to you this evening with gratitude in my heart that you have given us these moments together. We come and lay ourselves before you knowing that you are the sovereign of the ages. You are our God, very God of very gods. There is none like you. So Lord, we come and we place ourselves in your hands. We place ourselves you know, at your disposal. We seek only to be vessels, vessels that can be used in the hands of a mighty God. Lord, there are many that we pray for, many that need our prayers. I think of Tony and Megan as they've settled into a new community seeking and trying to find a church where you want to plant them and use them to reach people and disciple people. Lord, as I've talked to him, I hear sometimes a hint of discouragement that he sees uh, in churches in the South uh, uh, just uh, being apathetic, going through motions, but having no real heart or desire. So I pray, Lord, that you will lead him to that place where you'll have him, where, Lord, you can use what is in him to charge and supercharge that congregation for the cause of Christ. We love you. And, Lord, we know that you are faithful, and as you have led him there, not knowing what tomorrow holds, we do know, Lord, that you hold tomorrow. I lift Dale up to you and pray, Father, that you will guide him through these uh, transitional days and be with uh, Cynthia and, and uh, Ryan and guard them and encourage them. And be with Buddy, Lord, as uh, he's doing well, but uh, not because he's going downhill as well in uh, his battle of cancer. And be with Julia and his kids and, and, and her family, Lord, and just uh, encourage them. Be for them a strong and mighty tower. Thank you for protecting Linda and, and her friend, Lord, as they were traveling up the pass. Thank you for holding that tire back until they got to a place of safety. God, uh, you watch over us, much like a shepherd looks over his sheep. And, and God, we are grateful. Be with Buck and Janice. Keep them safe. And Lord, bring them home uh, uh, safely and, and soundly with uh, and, and, and give them an encouraging encouraging, uplifting word, Lord, as they come home. And God, for Cameron, we don't uh, know exactly the ways to help him, but Lord, you know what needs to happen to draw him to yourself and help him get through these emotional struggles that he's having. And God, for Mary and uh, for her granddaughter and great-granddaughter, thank you for getting them out of the fire safely and getting them to Mary's. But Lord, it means rebuilding her whole life again. But God, let her know that she has people behind her that love her as she goes through this time of transitioning itself. And that, Lord, she is not alone, but that you are there. Now, Father, I pray that you take us to your word tonight and encourage us uh, and refresh us in our fresh look, Lord, there at the tabernacle. To you be glory. We just want to thank you for the night and fill us now, Lord, full of your spirit, that we might know and understand, perceive, receive, and apply, and do what you show us in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, as we move fur, fur, further on in our study, if I can find my cursor, where there it is, right down there. All right, we're going to look, uh, as we, we, we look at this, uh, we could spend time, 
looking at the tabernacle like we have in the past and spent weeks upon weeks of doing that. But I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to spend weeks and weeks looking at the tabernacle. At this point, we may do another study of it. But I want to kind of do kind of an overview, and we're going to settle on one particular uh, element within the tabernacle for the next couple of weeks after tonight. So I, I want you to look. I want you to look at that picture of the tabernacle that is around and take a look at the furniture. See, each piece that went into the construction and function of the tabernacle points us to Christ. So when you look at the picture of the uh, tabernacle, there's a couple of things that catch your interest immediately. Uh, I don't know you, but generally our eyes fall on that building, that structure in the back part of the tabernacle there with the smoke coming out, of course. That is itself the tabernacle. Where you see that smoke coming out, that's the naos. That is the tabernacle of tabernacles. That is the holy of holies. That's the holy, most holy place in the tabernacle. But the tent of meetings there, the, the tabernacle itself is that little structure there toward the the back. But the next thing I think that catches your attention immediately is the linen white fence that surrounds the tabernacle. Uh, it, it was constructed high enough that you couldn't look over it. It was staked to the ground so it couldn't be peeked under. It was solid white linen attached to poles with uh, golden hooks and hung up, and it absolutely blocked the people from any view of the tabernacle. Any view of what went on in the outer court. Now you understand that there are three courts in the tabernacle complex. The outer court and the inner uh, court and the innermost court. So, you know, they couldn't see any of that. And there was uh, only one way. That, that wall represented a separation, a separation between God and mankind uh, because sin separates. And we need to realize that they had a visual picture of the separation that existed between them and God to draw on. Now, you and I, we walk through life. We don't always see that, that significant separation. Certainly, when we were lost in our trespasses and sins, we didn't see the significance of that separation. We didn't have that physical uh, uh, visual to draw on, but they did. And that uh, wall around, that linen wall around the tabernacle told them that they had to stay away. They could not approach God. They couldn't approach God except by one way. There was only one way into the tabernacle. And if you look at this end of the tabernacle, you'll see the panels that are of a different color. That's the door that leads into the outer court. And you see, that was the only entrance into the tabernacle complex was that door, the door to the complex. You see, Jesus is the door uh, that lets us in. He says, I am the door of the sheepfold. I, I, you know, I, and, and anybody that comes in to me, they're going to find safety. Uh, I am the good shepherd, and I shepherd by anybody that, that crawls over the fence. They're, they're, they're uh, not. They can't get in any other way except through me. Well, there's other things that go on in the tabernacle. Let me go back uh, one cell and, and point out a couple of things. There in the middle toward, really middle front, uh, in front of the door, there was a huge brazen altar. Uh, and it was uh, built up, uh, and they built a, a ramp of stone and sand, and it was there that sacrifice was being made. The fire the, the, that burned on the altar was the fire that lit not only the, uh, well, lit the lampstand inside the uh, holy place, and it was the only light that uh, was there to, to, to light that holy place. It was there that people would bring their sacrifice to the door of the temple complex, or the tabernacle complex. The priest would meet them there. The sacrifice would be taken. It would be, uh, you know, all preparation would be made. They'd take it up to the ramp to the brazen altar, and there they would kill the sacrifice and bleed its blood and let the fire consume it. If portions of that meat were to be distributed to the priests or back to the family, then that was taken care of, and the rest of it was destroyed on the altar. It is that altar that the one time a year sacrifice of the uh, Passover lamb was to be made. And it was at that gate that the blood of the Passover lamb was placed on the head of the scapegoat before it was to be let out 
into the wilderness, all pointing to Jesus. Now you'll see in front of the tabernacle proper and be between the tabernacle, the brazen altar, there's another little structure there. It's called the brazen laver. Now that's a basin of water, a huge basin of water. And all day long, while the priests ministered in the sand, they would get dirt on their feet and uh, their hands would get dirty. Frequently during the day, they would go in and they would wash in the laver, would show that that represents the fact that we need to be perpetually cleansed. It's not enough for us to be uh, uh, cleansed one time. We get defiled by the world around us. So we come to Christ for cleansing. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. All right, that laver represents Christ who is the one who takes away our sin. He is the purification for our sin at the altar. He takes away our, our, our sin there at the laver when we bring it to him and give it to him. But... After the brazen laver, we come to that uh, uh, tabernacle proper. That's where I'll show you a couple more pictures. And you'll see here, if you can see it, you have, uh, you have shark skin and you have uh, goat skin and you have, you know, you've got skins that in three layers that cover the tabernacle, uh, blocking out all light, preserving it from the elements as well. Inside the tabernacle, you had uh, three pieces of furniture, four pieces of furniture, three in the outer court and one in the inner court. You have the table of showbread. Uh, remember Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Uh, it represented the 12 tribes, but that bread also represented the life-giving, uh, uh, sustaining power of Christ. In there you had the golden lampstand with uh, uh, pure oil in it, and it burned, and it became the only light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, Whoever comes to me will not walk in darkness. He said, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will, will, will never hunger. He says, this is the, the bread that represents my broken body, which is for you. Remember, we just had the Lord's Supper. And then also, just before you get to the veil that separated the holy place from the holy holies, there was the altar of incense. And the altar of incense, here's kind of a blueprint of the tabernacle. The altar of incense had coals of fire that came off of the brazen altar from the outer court and then pure incense, a mixture that was, was given to them in scripture and they'd mix it up and it would go in representing the prayers of God's people and the intercession of Christ who ever lives to make intercession for us and the work of the Holy Spirit who also intercedes for us with groanings too deep for us to even understand. Now, there before the brazen altar was this thick uh, woven linen uh, uh, barrier. There was the veil that existed and set between them, and that veil separated the holy place from the holy of holies. Because behind that veil was the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat. Now, tomorrow, next week, we'll begin exploring that Mercy Seat and uh, hopefully uh, uh, be able to just really you know, be blessed by what we look at in it. But uh, behind that veil, there was the Ark of the Covenant holding the table uh, or the tablets of stone, the uh, pot of manna, and Aaron's rod that had budded. And over that box was a lid, and the lid contained a couple cherubim, and those uh, uh, cherubim, those golden cherubims with their wings outspread, formed the mercy seat. And God would meet with a whole high priest one time a year. He would be enthroned above the wings of the cherubim that made the seat, made the seat for our king to sit on, the mercy seat. And there the blood would be sprinkled from that Passover lamb and atonement would be made for the sins of the people. And we know that the high priest could only go in to the tabernacle, into the Holy of Holies, either in the tabernacle or the temple, one time a year. And he better be right and prepared to do so or they'd be dragging him out dead as a door. And wore those bells on his hems and a rope tied around his legs. So if he fell on those bells rung, they knew to drag him out because he was toast. We know that happened. We know it happened with Dadab and Abihu, the two sons of uh, uh, Eli, 
who desecrated, no, two sons of Aaron, who desecrated the temple with, with strange fire. And God destroyed them because of it. All right, we need to move on because next week we're going to pick up here with the mercy seat. But I want to bring this up to you and me where I can tell you that according to the word of God, you and I are the temple of God. We are the naos. You see that holy of holies, that place where the mercy seat is, is got a particular name in the Hebrew, and that's naos. Remember that from our study of Revelation. Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 7 and 18, it says, Do you not know that you are a temple of God? And that the Holy Spirit dwells in you just like it did in the naos of the tabernacle or of the temple. If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. You see, from the moment you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, he came by the Holy Spirit to dwell in your heart. He now wants to settle down and make himself literally at home in your life. In Ephesians 3 and verses 14 through 19, it says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through the Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses all knowledge. I intend to move that forward, and I did not. There we go which surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled up with all the fullness of God. The Apostle Paul uses the word dwell, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. He uses that word, and the meaning is to settle down in a dwelling, to dwell firmly in, in a particular place. The idea is to live in a home, to settle down and feel completely at home as a permanent residence. Where does he have this residence? It's through his spirit in the inner man, according to verse 16. It is that part of the believer that has experienced spiritual renewal by the Spirit of God. This took place at the new birth when the Holy Spirit regenerated us. And our bodies become the temple of the Holy Spirit where Christ dwells in the naos, if you will, because he purchased us with the price of his own blood. The dwelling place for God in this world was very costly in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. It says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, that you are not your own? You've been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. All of the earthly tabernacles and temples of old were short-lived in time and all ultimately were destroyed. However, there is an eternal temple that shall not be corrupted by death. It is eternal, a house not made with, the hand, with man's hands, eternal in the heavens. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ sets us free from the power of sin and death. The only condition for us to have that eternal dwelling place for him is to believe on Christ as our Lord and Savior. We are part of something far greater in God's eternal plan of redemption. Ephesians 2, Paul tells us that God is building a temple that involves you and me and every believer down through the history of the church. In Ephesians chapter 2, in verses 19 through 20, he says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God in 
his spirit. Truth. The New Testament church is a living, growing organism. And New Testament believers are included in God's temple, as Peter affirms in 1 Peter 2 and 5. Both Jews and Gentile believers are being joined together into one holy temple. And here again is that word naos. If you remember, again, from our study in Revelation, it always refers to that inner sanctuary, the holy of holies. Paul is not referring to the entire temple complex, the area with its open court, uh, Herion. God chooses and places individual believers in his temple. He builds it. And, and what is its purpose? It is to become a dwelling place which God lives by his spirit. God came down and met with his people in the Shekinah glory over the tabernacle and over the temple, but now he dwells in his new naos, his new temple, which is constructed of spiritually living, regenerated believers in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit indwells each believer individually who is a part of his temple. His corporate dwelling place is composed of all believers, both Jewish and non-Jewish. When is the last time you read about the tabernacle in the Bible? Well, the last time we read it is in Revelation 21.3. It's a picture of the new heaven and the new earth and, 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 and the new Jerusalem that come down. And the apostle John says that he heard a loud voice on the throne and the voice was saying this, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men again, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them. Then he goes on to tell us, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple, and the city has no need for sun or moon to shine in it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and the Lamb is the Lamb. Oh, my friends. Well, we have to ask ourselves, are we ready for that great and wondrous day when he shall come with trumpet sound and we should be joined with him? And in that day, see what the mortal eye has not seen. See what is there that existed in time immemorial that God could rail off and give off the plans of its construction for a copy to be made here on earth. A copy where... Well, the children of Israel wandered around with no home and no place to stay. Learning to trust God and live by faith in him, God would dwell with his people. That tabernacle in the wilderness where God would meet with his people and his people would meet with God. There in that place of sacrifice, there in that place of mercy and grace. And now, we behold the new temple. The one who came and tabernacled among us for a season. And those who were with him beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Who brought to us a definition and an understanding of grace that no other could. Who died, was buried, rose again. And made for himself a new temple to dwell upon this earth. In the meantime, you and me. Until that time should come that the temple would dwell among men again. And we would look and see the exalted God and the Lamb who are its temple. May God bless. Father, we thank you. Thank you for moments together. Thank you for your word that we can open and digest. And Lord, just kind of dive in and swim around in deep water. Lord, I come and I, I think so often when we come together that it's, it's, it's like seeing you on the boat. You teach. And then you tell them to launch out a little deeper so more people can hear and you teach. And God, let us walk out. Let us, let us launch out in the water as deep as possible so that we may glean out of you all the truth you desire us to know. Now bless our folks tonight. Bless the hearers in this lesson. Bless those that will listen after. But 
God, I pray you pour your spirit upon them, filling them to the full, that they would become vessels of honor used in the hands of the Master. Thank you, Father. Remember our requests that we have laid before you. Hear, oh, hear our prayers, O oh Lord, as we come to the mercy seat. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being along with this journey. Thank you for putting up with my slowness and my glitches. I'm working in unfamiliar territory, and uh, and uh, I have it down, I bet. I don't know. I don't have it down when I'm home. At any rate, God bless you. You all have a great evening, and I'll see you at 9 in the morning as we pick up again in Galatians and chapter 3. God bless you. We'll see you all later. Pray. We're going to be here until Saturday and driving home. Pray for a good trip for us to come home to. God bless.